Amen. Well, tonight we're going to wrap up this little brief series that we had on the promises of God. And uh, I just believe that this is something that if you can get a hold of these principles and apply them in your life, that it'll make such a difference in your life day by day by day. But as you grow in the Lord and you face battles and challenges, that there's going to be lots of opportunity for you to believe and stand on the promises of God. There always is, and I'm just telling you that wherever you are in that walk of faith, we can learn, we can keep growing. Guess what? He keeps us growing from faith to faith. He's always moving us on. We're always supposed to be growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I just want you to understand that uh, you're not going to get it all tonight, but you ought to get something. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I really do want to live in the promises of God daily that to live this life of faith that he's called us to. And when we talk about the promises of God, I want you to understand that whatever he says is a promise. Now, when I was a, a kid, I guess this was kind of true even most of my teen years until I turned my life over to the Lord. But... Um, most of the time, if I said something, I mean, it was true. I didn't lie much. It just didn't appeal to me. So most of the time, if I said something, it was true. And then if I said I promise, I mean, that was almost always true. And then if I said I swear to God, it 100% had to be true. Is this a thing for me? But here's what I want you to understand. And you know what? A, a lot of us, we've kind of known a version of that in our life. But what I want to say to you is that when we talk about the Lord, everything he says is true. Everything he says is absolute truth. Always. And I'm wanting you to understand this because, um, you know, there's not really actually very many times where the, the Scripture says, this is a promise. In fact, I don't know, you know, where the Lord says, okay, I promise you. You hear what I'm saying? You just need to understand that what he says is a promise. It is absolutely true. He is not a man that he should lie. He always keeps his word, everything he says. Listen, he cannot lie. The, did you know the Bible actually says God who cannot lie? That's right. He cannot. What is there anything God can't do? Yes, he cannot lie. Whatever he says is true. And so you need to understand that the word of God is full of promises because he says so many powerful things and we need to take them as promises for us that we can stand on, that we can believe. You know, Jesus tells us, let your yes be yes, your no be no, because anything more than that is from the evil one. And we need to understand that, that when, as a child of God, we need to be more like our father, that when we say it, you can take it to the bank. No more levels or sometimes. But anyway, you need to know that what he says is always right. He doesn't change and he doesn't lie. His word, it's always true. See, if he said it, you got his word on it, and that's good enough. But the word of God is just full of promises, and I want you to understand they're for us. It is part of our inheritance as a child of God. Second Peter 1, 3, and 4 says, His divine power has 
given to us His divine power. you got lots of power. Has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. By which we have been, which have, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. I tell you, our Father has provided everything that we need through the promises of God. We just have to receive them by faith. We need to take hold of what He's promised those exceeding great. And precious promises. The NIV says it this way. He's given us his very great and precious promises. Very great. You talked about this a little bit, but they're like treasures. Just one promise is so valuable, how it can change your life. Precious treasure. And here's the thing. They've already been given to us. These promises, they've already been given to us. And it is just a crazy time that we're living in when so many Christians today have so little Bible knowledge. We need to be seeking the Word, seeking God in His Word all the time, studying the Word, reading the Word. Getting it how we, I mean, if you can't read, well, then listen to it. Because you know what? You, you can say, Alexa, play First John for me. And it'll play it for you. You know what I'm saying? It's time people start using all that technology to get the word inside of you instead of a bunch of junk. But however you got to get it, get it. It's so available to us, and yet so many don't even know what these great, very great and precious promises are. They've already been given to us. And you you know what? We may feel unworthy or undeserving. It may seem like sometimes that these promises are too good to be true. But if He has already provided it for us, we need to realize that He wants us to have it. And these promises are for us. Second, Second Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God in Him, in Jesus, are yes and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Therefore, you. And you need to know that because if you don't know that the promises are for you, you'll never be able to believe and take hold of what God has already promised you. you got to know that it's for you. He gave us the promise of salvation. John 3, 16, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm just going to rattle off a few here, but there are literally hundreds or thousands of promises in the word of God. He promises us forgiveness. He promises us healing. He promises us protection. Here it is just in two verses, Psalm 103, 3 and 4. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. I'm just telling you, there are so many promises. He tells us in Isaiah 43, 43, when you walk through the fire, you're not going to be burned. You're not going to, the water's not going to overflow you. He says, I'm going to be with you. So many promises. John 14 and 27, he's promised us peace. Peace I leave you. I leave my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He gives us a promise of joy. John 15, 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. There are so many promises and you need to know they're for me. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of what He's done. It's by His grace that we're able to lay hold of these exceeding great and precious promises. Every one of them has to be appropriated, has to be received by faith. Mark eleven twenty two through 24 We talked about it last week. We need to look at it again. 
So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Jesus says it so simply, so plainly, have faith in God. Then he tells us how powerful our faith is. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now, I shared this last week, but it needs to be said again. We got to get the doubt out right in the middle of this verse. Jesus says, and does not doubt in his heart. And here he's talking about speaking to the mountain. I want you to understand that if you are saying things in unbelief, if you're speaking unbelief about your situation, you don't believe. If you're speaking unbelief, you don't believe. You got to get the doubt out. We know that you don't believe in your heart because... Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if you're talking doubt, you're not at a place of faith. And you need to, you need to go back to the word and get that word down inside of you until you believe it so that you can get the doubt out and you don't talk doubt anymore. But you know, there's another problem too, is that a lot of times people say they believe and they'll even talk faith but their life doesn't show it. But Jesus gives us this powerful promise for prayer, verse 24. I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And I want you to remember this verse. You ought to memorize it. Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Believe that you receive them. You see, if we want to receive the promises, this is how. You believe that you receive them and then you will have them. One town got together for a big prayer meeting and because they'd been having this terrible drought and, you know, they're going to pray and ask God for rain. One little nine-year-old girl showed up with an umbrella. They say it rained. It just takes one that really believes God. But I'm just telling you, if we really believe God, it'll show in the way that we live and the things that we do. If it doesn't show, I mean, if there's no, if there's no action to it, if, if, if there's no evidence of it in our life, we don't really believe. But when we really believe, it changes what we say. It changes how we live. When we really believe, we obey God. Now, I want you to understand, it's faith. But when we have real faith, we obey God. Sorry, I'm trying to filter, but I'm afraid it'll come out anyway. Believe in God for Mr. Right. And I'm just, you know, but I got to go out there to them nightclubs so I can find him. Good grief. You see, when we believe, we receive. When we really believe, we receive. We prayed whatever things you desire when you pray and you believe you receive. You believe you receive. What is that? You believe you have it. You may not have seen it in the natural yet, but you believe you receive. You believe that you have it. You know what that's called? Believe that you have it? That's called faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1. faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
Evidence of things not seen. Substance of things hoped for. You see, it's substance. It's evidence. It's something that you have. When you have that, see, that's faith. When you believe you receive, you shall have it. This is how the promises of God are appropriated in our life. When we really believe, I tell you, it will change the way that you live and the things that you do. See, we all know this. I mean, to be a believer in Jesus is not just to believe in his existence. It's to actively put your trust in him. A lot of people call him Lord, but they don't trust him. They won't turn their life over to him. And he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? They won't enter the kingdom of heaven. No, when we really trust him, when we really believe in him, then we're willing to turn our life over to him. James 2, we're going to start in verse 14. What does it profit, brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now I want you to understand this. It is not faith plus works. See? See? We don't add works to faith like we're earning something from God. You can't earn salvation, much less anything else. You can't earn. God will never owe you no matter what you do. It's not faith and works. It's faith with works. You see, it's faith, but it's a certain kind of faith. You need to understand this. It's a certain kind of faith. Not faith and works. doesn't say that. It says faith with works. It's a certain kind of faith. A faith that has works that go with it. Because a faith without works is a dead faith. If it does not have works, it's dead. What? The scripture says that pretty clear, doesn't it? But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? See, it's just plain foolish to say that you believe or to just think you believe you know, just saying it or thinking it is an effect of faith. No, it's got to be real faith, something that you live in your life, something that you act upon in your life. Because when we have that kind of faith, then it brings answered prayers. It brings blessings and miracles. It's faith that has works with it, faith that's acted on. James gives us two examples. Was not our father Abraham justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, you need to understand, there's a lot of people in our culture right now that say, oh, it doesn't matter what I do, I prayed the prayer. Deceived, so very deceived. Abraham was made righteous just like we are, by faith. In fact, when Paul is explaining righteousness by faith in Romans, he uses Abraham is the example. But it was his obedience that showed his faith, that his faith was real. 
Likewise was not Rahab the harlot. Talked about her Sunday. Hardly ever talk about old Rahab and here I'm getting two sermons in a row. Rahab the harlot, was she, she also was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Two simple examples, but I tell you, you see this all throughout the word of God. When we truly believe, there's going to be evidence of it in our life. I mean, you would never have heard of old Noah if he didn't do something with what he heard. Are you hearing me? The Lord told him, build a boat. And you know what he did? He built a boat. Why? I mean, it's crazy. Because he believed what God said, and it showed in his life. The Lord spoke to Abraham. He told him to leave his family, his way of life, his home, everything. He says, you're going to go out and I'll show you a place. He didn't even know where he's going. I'll show you when we get there. Abraham went. I'm just telling you that he had action to his faith. The children of Israel, when they finally did go into the promised land and they come to the walled city of Jericho and they get these instructions, march around the wall once a day, then on the seventh day, you march around seven times and give a shout and the walls will fall. That's crazy. You just do what God tells you to do. You see, if we really believe God's word, we'll obey him. I hadn't said it in a few weeks, so I'm going to say it. It's been a couple of months, several months probably, but it needs to be said a lot. I say it a lot. The reason that people don't tithe is not because they believe you don't have to. The reason people don't tithe is because they don't believe the promise that he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you cannot contain and he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. And how phony to say, oh no, I believe the promise, I just don't have to. No, if you believe the promise, you will obey God. Three of us are excited about that. (laughs) That's right. Thank you, brother. So many times in Scripture, they're simple acts of obedience that precipitate a miracle. Jesus says, fill the water pots. They fill the water pots and he changes it into wine. He tells Peter, cast the net on the other side of the boat. Lord, we've caught nothing all night, but at your word, we'll let down the nets. And he fills those nets with fish. Absolutely amazing. How about Luke chapter 17, that's 10 lepers. I want to read this one, at least part of it. It's verses 11 through 14. It happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off and they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was as they, that as they went, they were cleansed. Now the story goes on and talks about a certain Samaritan who was one of those 10 who came back and he gave thanks, he gave glory to God. But I I just want you to consider this. They wanted Jesus to heal them. And Jesus didn't, they were afar off. It says they stood afar off because they were lepers. Jesus didn't go over and lay his hands on those guys. Now there's another example where he did lay his hands on a leper. He didn't put his hands on these guys. He didn't even go over to them. He didn't speak a word. He didn't say, you are healed in the name of me. I mean, he didn't do any of that. He, you know, he didn't, he didn't spit on them. He didn't breathe on them. He, nothing. I mean, Jesus, we come and ask you for mercy and nothing.
All he says is, go show yourselves to the priests in Jerusalem. Now, when Jesus said that, they understood what that meant because when you were healed of leprosy, you had to go show yourself to the priest and they were the ones who would certify that you were cleansed of your leprosy so that you could again be back with your family, back in society, back at where you're able to come to worship again. But you just, you just need to understand that to these guys, when he says, go show yourselves to the priest, they understood what that meant. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. What if we just obeyed God, whatever he said? In faith, we just trust him. And so it was, as they went, they were cleansed. Amazing. Simple faith that had action with it. And the one that returns and gives thanks, he's a Samaritan. <laughs> the Samaritans were considered to be like dogs to the Jewish people. This guy, I don't think he would even have been allowed to go to the priests. But here he comes back to Jesus. And Jesus tells him that his faith has made him whole. And here's what I want to say about that. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when he walked this earth, he was full of grace and truth. And it, it's not just those... <laughs> you see, it's not those who seem to be religious. It's not those who had their act all together and they're just really great people. I mean, do you realize that Jesus never, ever... Turn somebody away because, well, you old sinner, you dog, you. Never, never. And I'm saying this to you because, you see, a lot of people, they, that's how the enemy steals their faith and keeps them from believing because they're, they're, they're trying to believe God on the basis of their goodness instead of his goodness. So often, it's just a simple act of faith. Go wash. Go show yourself to the priest. It is that obedience that comes from faith. Real faith has action with it. Mark 3, 5, he tells a man with a withered hand, stretch out your hand. In John 5, 8, he tells an invalid of 38 years, rise, take up your bed and walk. In John 9, 7, he tells a blind man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And all these things are so simple, but these people had faith to do it. And I'm telling you, in our life, whatever we're believing God for, we need to be willing to do what He says. And so often the Word, the promises of God, have a condition. They tell us what we're supposed to do. But sometimes when we believe, we receive. You believe, you receive. Here's what I want you to know. There's going to be a fight of faith between the time that you say, I believe I receive and the you shall have it comes, there's going to be a great fight of faith. First Timothy 6, 12, Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Now, sometimes, you know, you ask, you believe, and we see this in, in the gospels and many of the healings that a lot of the time they were instant. It just happened right then. Uh, the lepers, it was as they went, they were cleansed. But a lot of the time, it was an instant miracle. And God still does that. But so often, as believers, there's going to be a fight. There's going to be, listen to me, a fight of faith. It's not always easy to stand and believe when the circumstances are so adverse and against you. You know, when the Israelites went into the promised land that 
they, that second generation that went in, they believed that God had given it to them, but they still had to fight for it. They fought one battle after another to take hold of what the Lord had promised them. And you know what? That's the way it is for us a lot of the time. Anybody ever feel like you fight one battle after another? We do, don't we? Just one after another. And people get disillusioned because just like the Israelites, when the Israelites, the first time they came to the promised land, I mean, it was promised to them, but they didn't know they was going to have to fight for it. It's like, hey, there's giants in the land and walled cities and we're scared. We ain't going in. And they didn't go in. And I think a lot of Christians get all disillusioned and taken aback because sometimes there's a fight of faith. Sometimes there's a battle for you to possess, for you to take hold of that promise that God has given to you. You got to be ready to stand in faith. Just remember this. When you're standing, you're fighting the fight of faith, your faith is tried. Delay is not denial. No, you have to hang on to your faith. You have to hang on. You believe, you receive, you keep believing. You see with eyes of faith, but we stand and fight the good fight of faith. We don't fight in the natural. No, our fight is not with flesh and blood. But so often we have all kinds of thoughts and there's circumstances and there's opposition. The enemy will throw everything he can at you to get to undermine your faith. So you got to know the promise of God. You need to know what his word says. You know, the Bible says in 1 John that if we pray according to the will of God, then we have confidence that he hears us and we know that, that we have the things we've asked of him. I'm just telling you, you see, when we stand on a promise of God, we can pray with great confidence and know that it's done, know that it's, the answer is coming no matter what it looks like. But so often there is that trying of your faith. We talked about this verse, but I want to go there again. It's James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or perseverance, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Trials, problems, all kinds of difficulties. I'm telling you, even the best Christians, even the most godly people, we all face those things. And he says we can face them with joy because our faith is being tried and we are going to persevere and that perseverance is going to develop something in us that we are mature and complete, ready for whatever God has for us. So many people think that serving the Lord means they're not going to have problems. No, it just means you overcome. And how do we overcome? We overcome by faith. That's what the Bible says. But many times that trying of your faith is actually preparing you for the answer to your prayer. And it just takes a lot longer than some of us would like sometimes. Moses was chosen to be God's deliverer from the time that he was a little baby. The Lord had ordained that. But it took 80 years for God to get him ready. Maybe he's getting you ready. Maybe it won't take 80. David was anointed to be king when he was about 15 years old. But he didn't get to be king until he was about 30 or so. Guess what? God was getting him ready. Joseph, Joseph had these dreams of how he was going to be in great authority and all this. And, but you know what happened next? 
He gets sold into slavery, put into prison, and forgotten is about 12 years later before God fulfilled those dreams that he'd given to him. I'm just telling you that sometimes between that time where you say, I believe I receive, there's going to be a fight, there's going to be a battle, there's going to be a period of time before you actually have it where you can see it. Until then, you just have to see it with eyes of faith because you believe that you receive. Believe in that you're going to be successful in a certain career. I said, God will open the door when you're ready. Believing for a spouse, perfect person for you. Oh, Lord, bring them right along when it's time. You know what everybody says to that? No, I'm ready now. Well, you just trust the Lord to work it all out for your good. Some people believe in for a certain ministry. I tell you, the trying of your faith has everything to do with your preparation. Count it all joy. Paul told Timothy, fight the fight of faith. Listen to what he says to him in 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Are you waging a good warfare? Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. See, by the word that's spoken to you by the promises that you have laid hold of? Are you waging a good warfare? You take the word, you take the promise of God, and you use it to fight that battle. You stand on that promise. The word of God, the Bible says in Ephesians 6, it is the sword of the Spirit. You use the word of God to fight that battle. Now, I know that I'm, you know, I'm putting this out here. I know that sometimes, listen, people get healed. God does miracles in people's lives. And, you know, like I said, it's an instant thing. There's not much of a battle. But I also know that as we live this life, most of us, we go through this where there is one battle after another. And we learn how to fight. We learn how to overcome. And we get stronger. And I'll tell you, God is glorified in our lives when that happens. See? And when you, when you have fought and you have taken hold of that promise, you believe, you receive, and you finally see that breakthrough come, I want to tell you something. Sometimes you have to defend it by faith because the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He'll try to steal your peace. He'll try to steal your joy. He'll try to steal your finances, your health, your victory. Your peace, I already got that one, didn't I? But I'm just telling you, he's going to try to steal from you, and you have to fight that fight of faith. You have to defend what God has given to you. You stand on the word of God. You refuse to change your confession, but you, you keep speaking in faith. Refuse to give in to the enemy. As I can tell you this, that I've seen a lot of healings and deliverances. I've seen the blessing of God on people's life, financial blessings, all kinds of blessings that God had given to people. And then just a short time later, they're back where they were. You need to hang on to the promise of God. And when the enemy comes and tries to steal, you defend what God has given to you. You defend it with the word of the Lord, standing in faith. One of David's mighty men, mighty men of valor was Shammah. In 2 Samuel 23, 11 and 12, it says, Shammah, the son of Agi, the Heronite, or Herite, I wish I could pronounce some of these. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils, beans, so the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it. He killed the Philistines, so the Lord brought about a great victory. I tell you, this guy was willing to fight for, that, for those beans. He said, nuh-uh. One guy. And here's what I'm saying to you. The devil may throw everything at you 
If you'll stand and fight, you use the sword of the Spirit as your weapon. I'll tell you, you can put him to flight. He's given you power over all the power of the enemy. But you have to be willing to fight the fight of faith. Stand your ground and believe the word of God. Believe the promises are for you. Even when, you know, you're preaching healing and, and, you, and you're limping around. Some of y'all see me limping around. I'm doing good right now. My ankle feels real good. I'm just telling you, it's always a battle. There's always something. But you have to learn how to fight the fight of faith and refuse to give in, but stand and believe God. Believe you receive. I got it, Lord. I believe it. I believe I have it. And then it shows in our conversation. It shows in our life. If it isn't showing in your conversation, if it's not showing in your life, you need to go back to the Word as the Word will bring faith in your heart. Go back. Get you that promise. Get it down in your heart until you really believe it. Stand with me. We're going to pray and I'm going to let you go.